Can a moon have a moon? If so, what would we call such an object? And do we know of any moons out there that could possibly pull this off? A few years back, my research team discovered Kepler 1625b-i, the first exomoon candidate. But what made the candidate particularly astonishing was the enormous size, a Neptune-like moon orbiting a super Jupiter mass planet. Still to date, we don't know whether the candidate was real or not, because Kepler suffered a mechanical failure preventing it from reobserving the star. Nevertheless though, just last year and right here in the Cool Worlds lab, we found the second exomoon candidate, Kepler 1708b-i. Once again, the object was rather startling though, a mini Neptune sized moon this time around a Jupiter sized planet. Even though these objects remain unconfirmed, they have sparked plenty of discussion and one question I've received again and again is, could these moons have their own moons? Now, since Kepler 1625b-i is a Neptune-sized moon, then the temptation is to compare it to Uranus and Neptune, both of which of course have dozens of satellites around them. And so, by extension, submoons might seem quite promising then. But, of course, Uranus and Neptune are planets, which means they must have had a very different history than that of Kepler 1625b-i perhaps sufficiently so that we really shouldn't expect to find anything in orbit. Probably the simplest thing we can say without any controversy is that at least for a small satellite, yes, it is possible to put that in orbit of a moon because, hey, we've already done it. In fact, we've been doing it since the 1960s. In March 1966, the Soviet mission Luna 10 became the first of now many vehicles to successfully orbit the moon, in fact completing over 460 orbits before the mission was terminated. But whilst that was indeed a satellite, it wasn't a natural satellite, nor indeed a long-lived one. And of course, we have to admit that by astronomical standards, those were just tiny objects. So the question remains, how large of a moon can sustainably orbit around another moon? To figure this out, let's take a step back and ask, even if these moons somehow formed their own satellites, let's call them submoons for the moment, would those submoons survive for billions of years? It's one thing to make a submoon, it's another thing to hold on to it. A smaller body in orbit of a larger body can be lost through two basic processes. They either get too close or too far apart. If they get too close, then the smaller body can get tightly ripped apart or even just crash together in a dramatic encounter. On the other hand, if they drift too far apart, then the gravitational tug of other bodies in the system can disrupt the pair. Now for a moon orbiting a planet, the primary other source of gravity is the star which the pair orbit, and the threshold distance at which the star will essentially steal away the moon defines the so-called Hill Sphere, one of the most important concepts in orbital dynamics. If a moon drifts outside of this region, which technically isn't a perfect sphere, then it will be lost. Or in fact, usually even about half of a hill radius is often sufficient. Now the reason why this inner and outer distance matters so much is because the orbits of moons gradually evolve over time. Every moon in the solar system is slightly changing its orbit each and every day. Nothing has permanence. Our own moon exemplifies this, moving away from us by four centimeters every year. But why? Because of one word, tides. The moon raises tides on the earth, giving us two high tides per day. This happens because the moon's gravitational influence is slightly different across the earth's surface, gently massaging the oceans towards the sublunar and antilunar positions, causing this kind of bulging effect. Now, since the Earth rotates once every 24 hours, which is much quicker than the Moon's revolution, then this bulge can be thought of as trying to overtake the Moon, but then it gets pulled back through the gravity of the Moon again. This effectively slows the Earth down, gradually reducing its spin over time. However, since the Earth-Moon system, like any other pair of objects, has to conserve angular momentum, then the slowing down of the Earth demands an increase elsewhere in the system. 
Like a skater sticking its legs out to slow down, the Earth can be thought of as sticking its moon out, pushing the moon away into an ever wider orbit. If we could make the moon more massive, then this process would happen even quicker, because the tides raised on the Earth would be greater. But make the moon too heavy, and the recession rate becomes so fast that the moon will escape the hill sphere in just a few billion years or less, thus defining an unstable moon. So look, really, you can put any size moon around any size planet and be okay, at least in the short term. But if you want stability for billions of years, then very large moons become precarious because of their very rapid tidal migration rates. And I should also note that these motions don't always have to be a recession. The moon would actually slowly fall into the planet if the Earth were spinning slower than the moon's revolution rate, a lunar month. It would be an understatement to say that the film Moonfall did not accurately portray this on the big screen. This process of migrating in or out, also known as tidal acceleration, is the primary limiting factor as to how big of a moon a planet can hold onto. And so by the same token, it is also the primary limiting factor as to how large of a submoon a moon can hold onto. In the same way that a planet has a hill sphere around it where its gravity dominates over that of the star, allowing for moons, a moon also has a smaller hill sphere around it where its gravity dominates over that of the planet, allowing for submoons. But merely residing within the moon's hill sphere is not suffice. The submoon must also be small enough that it can stay there for billions of years. Too big, and the tides that it raises upon the moon will cause the submoon to exit that region too expediently. Much of the theory of moon tidal evolution was worked out decades ago, especially in a classic paper by Barnes and O'Brien in 2002. And so, starting from this, one can really just reuse that theory, but just switch over the labels to apply this to submoons. And that's exactly what Kalmeyer and Raymond did back in 2019, shortly after we announced Kepler 1625b-i. So let's take a look at their results and start with Saturn as an interesting test case. In this figure, we're assuming that the submoon is pretty small, just 10 kilometers in size as a fiducial example. On the X and Y axes, the authors are varying the properties of their host moon. Specifically, the X axis varies the distance between Saturn and the moon, and the Y axis changes the size of that moon. Kolmeyer and Raymond find that any moons above this line could hold on to a 10 km submoon, so this seems good news. Indeed, this result should make sense. The the further away the moon is from Saturn, the larger its hill sphere will be because Saturn's gravity diminishes at larger distances. We can also change the submoon from 10 km in size to 20 km, which gives us this dashed line, or 5 km, giving us this dotted line. So far, this is pretty generalized, but now let's add Saturn's actual real moons onto this diagram. Titan, which is by far the biggest moon around Saturn, is certainly in the running for holding onto a submoon. But really, it's her less famous brethren Iapetus that steals the show as the best submoon host. In fact, according to this model, Iapetus should be able to hold onto a submoon up to a respectable 195 kilometers in size, which is about the size of Mimas. Now, looking at the other solar system planets, Callisto around Jupiter and the Moon around the Earth are also capable of holding onto small submoons, but neither displace Iapetus as the submoon king, at least in theory. Now, Iapetus does not have any known submoons, nor indeed do Callisto, Titan, or the Moon. So, does this therefore establish that submoons are impossible? Well, not quite, because remember that moons are constantly changing in their orbits. So it's quite possible that these moons started out their lives closer to their planets, had smaller hill spheres around them as a result of that, and then consequently lost their submoons fairly expediently, so we just don't see them today. In fact, Kolmeyer and Raymond highlight that Iapetus may in fact already be presenting us with clues about a previous submoon. You see, Iapetus has this interesting ridge running along its equator, which largely remains a mystery in planetary science. 
In 2011, it was suggested that something may have smashed into Iapetus, forming a temporary submoon as well as a ring of debris. Over time, the submoon may have evolved outwards and eventually escaped, just as we've been discussing in this video, but the ring of debris instead may have rained inwards, forming the ridge. Submoons in the solar system are certainly fun to imagine, but the prospects of submoons become much more interesting when we look out to these new giant exomoon candidates that we've recently discovered, things like Kepler 1625b-i. In this case, the moon is estimated to be capable of holding on to a much more formidable submoon of similar size to the dwarf planet Ceres. Of course, such a submoon would still be too small to be detectable with current technology, even with JWST. But if these giant exomoon candidates are real, then that suggests there should be more of them out there in the cosmos, and perhaps then there are even better submoon hosts just waiting to be found. So could we imagine an even more suitable submoon host? One extreme case we can consider is taking Jupiter around the Sun, but making it 10 times more massive, a super Jupiter planet, yet not heavy enough to be called a brown dwarf. Now imagine that we put a Neptune-like moon around it, similar to Kepler 1625b-i, but parked much further out at 800 planetary radii, which would still be within half of a hill radius away from the planet. Okay, so far so good, that Neptune-like moon would be plenty stable out there. Now we could put a pretty big submoon around that moon. Let's go for an Earth-sized one for fun. Such a submoon is perfectly stable as long as the moon host is at least 100 planetary radii away from the planet, which of course is true because we chose 800 for that number. So to recap, we have a Sun-like star that has a super Jupiter-like planet that has a Neptune-like moon that has an Earth-like submoon. And so one question we might ask is could that Earth-like submoon itself have a moon? So I don't know what we call that. It's getting ridiculous. A moon, 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 a sub-submoon, you tell me. The Neptunian moon here has a hill radius of 276 Neptune radii, so let's park our submoon at 130 to be safe. And by placing it like that, our submoon would have its own little hill radius around it of 135 Earth radii. Plenty of space for a sub submoon, it would seem. Putting something at the outer limit of about half of that for stability, so that's 60 Earth radii, that would allow for a maximum sub submoon of something like 50 kilometers in radius. Not too shabby, a good size for an asteroid base perhaps. So initial calculations do indeed suggest that yes, you can have moons of moons, and perhaps you can even have moons of moons of moons, although you need some fairly well chosen parameters to pull that off. However, one issue is that the current calculations allow for the submoon's orbit to evolve, but not the moon. And that's really not realistic because we know that moons tidally migrate as well. Anyone looking for a good research project here could perhaps revisit these calculations accounting for that motion, which would undoubtedly reduce the range of submoons further, but I doubt it would be enough to make them impossible. I'm happy to offer any tips if you take that up. So if we do find one of these things one day, what should we call them? I've been using the phrase submoon in this video, but others have suggested moon moon, or perhaps we might even imagine moon squared or moon cubed. But another suggestion might be just to drop the word moon altogether because it's kind of confusing. And after all, we don't call moons sub planets or planet planets. So why are we doing that here? I'm sure you have some ideas. Please do let me know down below in the comments what you think. As a final thought, these calculations remind us that wholly new astronomical objects might yet be lurking amongst the stars. I think that this underpins why astronomy, despite being the oldest of sciences, still captivates us like none other. For even today, we've barely scratched the surface of what awaits us out there. Submoons, quark stars, cosmic strings, and much, much more that we've likely never even imagined. For many, I know that these unknowns can feel frustrating. Perhaps we might wish that we had been born at a time when all had been found. But for me, I think it's worth cherishing that we get to live in an age of discovery, in a time where our imagination can still wonder. So, until next time, stay thoughtful, 
Stay curious. Thank you so much for watching everybody. If you enjoyed this and want to support my research team's hunt for exoplanets, exomoons, and hey, maybe even submoons and sub submoons as well, then be sure to click the link up above where you can become a donor to my research team at Columbia University, just like our latest two donors who I want to personally thank, that is Lee Deacon and Ryan Provost. Thank you so much for your support. So thanks again for watching and see you around the galaxy.